Woo. Yeah. Man. Yeah, we, are, we are daily live, aren't we? <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. I'm glad that uh, everybody's been able to come out today. Uh, had a uh, little bit cooler day than uh, we've had in the past. Nice day outside to get out and do some things, and uh, we just thank the Lord for that. And uh, I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then we'll go through our, uh, our prayer list. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings and that uh, you've given us, the way you have provided for us in all ways, Lord. We just lift you up for that, and we praise you for that. Lord, we just ask that you'll be with us as we go through uh, some scriptures here tonight, that we go through our prayer list. We just ask that you will uh, hear the uh, request made, Lord, for you know, as, as intercession for those who need it. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you'll be, uh, that, that no one will hear me speak, Lord, only hear you speak through your word. And Lord, we just ask that you will be with our church and all our young people as they are gathered together this, morning, this, this afternoon, that you will uh, guide them and, and they, that uh, they will be led to you, those who haven't, those who have, that they learn better how to serve you. And that's what we're here for, Lord, is to serve you. And uh, the instruction we hear tonight, uh, we just like for it to come from you and that we can put it better use in our lives. Uh, those who are in our community, Lord, who are uh, suffering from whatever ill, Lord, those who are lost, who haven't found you, Lord, do we just lay, lay all those needs at their feet and just ask that you'll open the hearts of those who have not found Jesus as their Savior, right, that you will uh, uh, break those hardened hearts and open their ears that they can receive the most precious gift of all. And Lord, as we uh, start our lesson here tonight, uh, we just ask that you'll be among us. As it always says, a few of us are gathered together in your name that you will be among us. Let us feel your presence. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right. Uh, if you look at the prayer list. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that, Bill. A little out of practice. All right, let's stand. Oh, 
Okay, now for the prayer list. Okay, good. Right. <laughs> well, as as most of you know, probably the pastor and Kelly and Carol Whitfield are in Nicaragua, uh, looking toward uh, what how we can serve better down there, and uh, they're doing kind of a fact fish, fact finding mission, and uh, maybe to pray, uh, maybe that uh, to see what God leads us to do down there in the future. And uh, we definitely want to remember them and their prayers and their travels and, and everything that they're doing at this uh, in Nicaragua and that they have, their safety will be afforded them and, uh, and that uh, God will open their eyes to the mission that we need to do down there. Uh, let's look over our prayer list. and We got a, we got a really long prayer list. And uh, I know uh, any additions, I know... Uh, there are several in our, uh, our church family that uh, uh, need a special prayer. Uh, I, I talked to, I talked to, uh, I hadn't talked to anybody about Miss Lottie or, or uh, uh, today. Anybody had an update on her? I think she got home. Is that correct, Lottie Westinger? I know there's one that that uh, I think Miss Sonia heard. I don't know how she's doing either. I think she's been in the hospital as well. From uh... Lynette, did you hear something from Jane or Leon? Someone said that she'd she'd had some rough days, but she's. I think the last I heard that she was doing a little bit better. But I'm not sure she's out of ICU yet. Okay. Thank you. 
That's wonderful. Anyone else on uh, our prayer chain, on our prayer list? I have not since Sunday. I uh, heard a little bit Sunday they were still doing some tests on her. And uh, if that's the last I heard, Rod, I don't know. Oh, Rita Eddie. Oh, Rita Addy to have surgery next week. I knew that was upcoming this week. I didn't know when it was because Ned had kind of kept up with her as well. Megan McCartney, she's a former teacher at Hollywood, I think, and uh, uh, living in Charleston now, I think, has a young child, uh, had been battling all types of cancer for several years now, and uh, I think her goal was to see her child grow up, and, and, and she's... She's still uh, having places on her head. I think it was multiple places on her head, scalp that she was going to have surgery with. So, uh, uh, 
I don't see him on the list. Hunter Blackman. Yep. I do have a, a praise I'd like to, most of you, well, many of you probably don't know this, this, this man, but I'm sure Rod does. William Bell. Um, William has been in the nursing home or assisted living for about five years. And uh, he was a farmer down in the, the ward area. And uh, Harry Bell used to be president of the Farm Bureau. That's his son. Anyway, we had a cow sale this past weekend. And I didn't know, I mean, last time I saw William, he was in the nursing home over here. And that's been a couple of years ago. He'd been, I think, it, you know, generations in Batesburg for a couple of years since then, assisted living. And uh, I, I didn't know he was even able to get out when he was nursing home. and never saw him out of the bed. He just kind of laid there. And I'd go in, I spoke to him a couple of times, but not too responsive. And, and he came up to me and uh, he said, Brad, I'm, I'm a lot better. I said, well, I see you are, William. I said, you, you get out. He said, he said, you know, I laid, laid up for about five years and said one night I asked God to heal me and I was healed the next morning. And he said, I'm still having to live in assisted living, but I'm able to get out. He, he said, I've had the best time today because I got out. And he stayed, he stayed up there with us all through the sale, and somebody, somebody dropped him off, and he was going to catch a ride back home. He wasn't worried about getting back home, but he, he said, somebody be going that way. They'll take me back. And uh, I said, William, you, uh, one of us can stay. He said, no, no, I'm having the best time. Y'all just work on. Y'all keep doing what you're doing. And it's, it's just amazed me, the power of our, of our God. And, and William is, is unashamed about telling you where his, his cure for his illness, whatever it was, his ailment was. And uh, I mean, it, it just, it's just amazing. It really is. And that's, that's one praise that I have. Uh, that just uh, really struck my heart to know that that uh, a man got to that point and he asked God to heal him and, and he was healed. Anybody else we need to remember? Well, I'm going to ask Mr. Ray if he would uh, do a, a prayer here for our... Did you figure it out? <laughs> That's it. That's good. <laughs> I'm going to start by a praise and a thank you. If you can direct your eyes up toward the choir loft, there's a new handrail up there that goes from the stairs all the way up to the back row where the men sit. And it sure enables an old man who doesn't see well to get there. And whoever put that up, I want to thank them for it <laughs> in advance, even though it's kind of neat to have someone hold out a hand and say, Ray, let me help you. That's a blessing that we all share in this church is there's always someone willing to help you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight praising your name for all the wonderful things and wonderful stories that we have heard here tonight of miraculous cures. This is not uncommon for us as Christians to hear because we hear it so often. Somehow it still manages to surprise us when it happens. We pray for something, as Brad was telling us, and the next day it happens. It's always on your, your timetable, dear Lord. We know that. But we thank you that you're always there to hear our prayer request. We praise your name. We confess our sins. And we... Uh, awaiting our message tonight. We thank you for everything that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ray. You know, sometimes the Lord lays something on your heart. Strange ways, I, I think about uh, years ago, I went in, I was going to uh, have Sunday school at the nursing home, and uh, I heard a, a quail whistle. I hadn't, I hadn't heard one out there in years, and a quail whistled out there. And I, I, uh, I went inside, and the uh, first person I saw was Mr. James Eddy. He gave me my first bird dog. And, uh, I mean, little things like that I think we need to pay attention to sometime. You know, it's just, 
you know, God speaks to us in, in, in ways that sometimes we're not attentive to it. And sometimes we have to, uh, you know, just kind of think about things. And, and that just struck me as, you know, God, you, you, you had that bird out there for me because he whistled and I go inside and the first person I see, I think it was the first Sunday Mr. James had been there. And there's a man who gave me my first bird dog. And, uh, you know, that sounds, maybe that sounds a little far-fetched, but, but to me, God was speaking. Sometimes we, uh, and, and something happened recently that, uh, to me, not very pleasant, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Brad, that's not a coincidence, that's a God incident. That's exactly right, that's a God incident. But anyway, it brought brought this uh, scripture to me this morning, and it's very familiar to it, but it's uh, Luke 15, verses 8 through 10, the parable of lost coin. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found the peace which I have lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repeat for who repents. You know, it's not uncommon for us to lose things, and uh, here lately at my house has been very common to lose things. Uh, we've, uh, after about 40 years, uh, it was time to remodel. I'm not, uh, well, we've been, Nets been wanting to remodel for quite a few years, but it got to the point where every, all our appliances were breaking down. And uh, we were kind of forced into going ahead and do some remodeling. And uh, when you remodel, you know, uh, there's, there's just so much turmoil in your house. The cabinets and the closets, everything had to be emptied. You know, all the kitchen pots and pans had to be, had to be boxed up, moved out of the way so they could tear the old cabinets out. You know, uh, canned goods had to be put away somewhere else uh, since they were just really tearing all the old cabinetry out. Uh, you know, there were things that we we need and things that we we thought we needed that we really don't need, uh, that we thought we'd only use occasionally. Uh, you know, you need them, and then where are they? And uh, uh, some things, too, that are maybe too, too useful to discard, but not something you use every day, uh, had to be boxed up and put away. And... Uh, Net did a good job, but there were so many boxes of this, that, and the other that, uh, you know, they were kind of uncatalogued. I mean, she knew where things were, but there's a few little things that, that we didn't, didn't come, didn't, uh, didn't, weren't able to find. And they, they, they weren't really lost, but we just didn't know where they were. And it really wasn't worth the effort to go through all those boxes to find them. You know, there, believe me, there's been boxes and boxes of items that have been discarded all along the way. I mean, uh, I don't know how many uh, uh, school teacher mugs that we'd stored up Christmas presents to the teacher back there that taught for 30-something years uh, that uh, we just didn't have a use for anymore and we had to, had, to do, had to move some of them away and get them out of our way. And so, uh, and plenty of other things that we just thought we needed at the time and really didn't need and said, well, you know, we hadn't used this in 20 years. I don't think we're going to use it in the next 20, so we just, we got, we just dispose of them. In other, words, in other words, you know, you can't find many things that we thought we would not need during this process, but we found they were too, too good to uh, necessarily get rid of. Uh, I have one case in point that, that, uh, that, was, that really upset me, and uh, a neighbor gave us some sweet corn. And you know, you, when you go to cut, I mean, it was pretty good little quantity of sweet corn, and we don't let, let sweet corn go to waste. And uh, so I decided that, uh, well, Ned, she said, you get it, Ned always, I get it shucked and take it in, and we silk it together and got it ready. And I said, well, where's my sharpening stone, Ned? I said, got to sharpen a knife before I, before I cut corn off. Well, that was another thing, and you know, it's kind of, Try cutting corn off a car with a dull knife. That is not any fun. And uh, we just, that's one of the things that I, I did dig and dig and dig, and I never found my sharpening stone, but I did find a knife that kind of halfway cut it off. But um, I, I wasn't too happy that day, wasn't it? <laughs> but anyway, you know, some things are, uh, 
easily replaceable and, and some things that you just can't do, you know, we, we think we can't do without. But what happens when we lose something that's irreplaceable? Uh, it may be a gift from a loved one that you know they had to sacrifice and it's not replaceable uh, and, and it's gone and you just can't replace it. Uh, those things, that, you know, that really bothers you when you have something that, that's been given to you. They know the person had to sacrifice it. Maybe they're going on to, going on to heaven. You can't replace those things. And that's kind of hard to deal with. And we have, you know, we ha always have hope that we're going to find that item, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. And uh, if we do, you know, that brings a lot of joy and relief to us when we, when we find that. Uh, many times, though, that doesn't happen, does it? Uh, or it's an impossible situation. And I, th and I think about all, all the folks uh, that just went through the, the fire in Hawaii. I mean, they've lost everything. Uh, it's just uh, unimaginable how destructive that thing, how fast it happened. And, and you know, of course, the loss of life is, is the worst thing, but still, uh, there's still things that in that catastrophic fire that uh, it, uh, just are, are irreplaceable. Uh, you think about your, all your photographs, and I know most of them on our phone now, but but uh, still, I mean, a lot of those old old photographs and things like that, and uh, things that uh, just wouldn't you you can't put a dollar value on that they'll never be replaced. And you know, it's just just this week I think they've allowed some of the residents to come back into part of those areas, and I'm sure they're sifting through uh, uh, what's left of their homes and and trying to find some of the things that that survived the the fire. You know, they're going to need our prayers. They need our prayers now, and I'm sure we've lifted them up, and they're going to need their pr our prayers for years to come as they, as they uh, put, try to put their lives together. And, and you know, we all know that it'll never be the same. They'll never have that the community that they had, and, and uh, it's just going to be hard to, uh, you just can't replicate what they had. Two weeks ago, I lost, lost something that, I, you know, I never took for granted, but, I, you know, I always felt it would be there for me. And... Uh, and it, to me, it's one of those things that's irre, irreplaceable. You know, right after we got married, I bought Ned a, a, uh, a Bible. And uh, it was hers, but I kind of commandeered it because it, it fit me really well. Uh, I think I took it every, I know I took it every uh, Sunday school lesson that I had at the nursing home. Uh, it brought it to church every Sunday. Uh, it was it was special to me, and, and we shared it. She used it too. I mean, it's her Bible, but I liked it more. Uh, not that I liked it more. I mean, I kind of said, "Well, Ned, I got to have the Bible. This this just works better for me." And uh, so uh, anyway, I I kind of took a Bible from her, even though I gave it to her. Anyway, uh, you know, it, the size was right. It fit me good, and and uh, even though the it was a, a smaller Bible, and and this one's. The print's much better because I got these old eyes, uh, but I could I still like to use it because it, it just felt like it was it was it just fit me better for some reason. And over 40 years, uh, 40 plus years, let me say that uh, I had underlined a lot of scripture. I had uh, lit, written a lot of notes in that Bible. I had written a lot of quotes from preachers out of this pulpit. And from other preachers that I had listened to, and uh, I can't replicate that. I mean, I know a lot of them, but I, you know, a lot of them, my memory is not that great. Uh, and, and it's pretty special to me to be able to go back and the front, the front and back, the covers in the front. I had it; it was just slap full of all those things that I jotted down that that really touched me during those years. And and so that that. Uh, it just uh, really impacted me a lot to lose that Bible. And uh, the way it came about is, is my son is a deacon of the week. It so happened that uh, we had a meal in the social hall to uh, meet with the potential new associate pastor. And... Uh, after the uh, meal, I mean, it's, you know, we do all, we go see Billy and count up, and then we go eat. And uh, after the uh, meal, uh, 
I go, I said, well, I better go back through the church, make sure everything's turned off, all the lights out, and, and uh, you know, make all sure the doors are locked. That's part of our duties as deacon of the week. And uh, after that, I uh, I came back and came back through the social hall. And they were kind of cleaning up and getting ready to, to leave out. And uh, so uh, anyway, I thought when I left, I know when I left Billy, I carried my Bible out. Anyway, thought I did. Anyway, I go down to the social hall and we do that and have our lunch and, and all that. And we leave and I go as I go out the door, Brandon's out there and he has a box full of uh, extra meals that, that uh, uh, were left over. And he was going to deliver them to uh, some of our shut-ins, you know. And he mentioned, well, I said, well, Brandon, give me one. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it to you. I'll take it with that one. I said, you don't have to take that one. I'll get it. So anyway, I, uh, we, uh, we left. And uh, the next morning I got up and uh, where's my Bible? I said, well, Nett must have got it. She probably got it, took it. So I asked Nett, I said, where's, the, where's, the, uh, where's my Bible? And I said, call him my Bible, her Bible. You know, I said, Where, where's the Bible? And she said, I don't know. I said, I said you didn't get it? And I thought maybe she'd picked it up, you know, when we left. And, no, no, I, don't, I didn't get it. So I didn't believe her. I went out and looked in the car. And it wasn't there. Went back and looked in my truck. It wasn't there. Uh, so got a little concerned. I said, well, I must have left it at church. So I come back to church, and I retraced my steps. I didn't find it, so Jeff was here, and Lynn, I go, said, y'all had not seen a Bible, have you? I said, no, no. If we find one, we'll put it out here so somebody will see it or, or leave it where it is, you know. So... And I said, okay, well, I go back. I said, well, I'm going to go look again. Went back my same steps, you know. Went back the third time looking for my Bible. I said, oh, man. Anyway, it bothered me. It really bothered me a lot, you know. I said, I don't know what could have happened to it. And I start thinking back to what I did that day. And I said, well, I went out the door. I think I did I have it in my hand. I don't know. I mean, why do we, I mean, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's me. But you don't, not conscious of things you do all the time, you know. And uh, I said, well, start with Brandon. I got that meal in my hand. I said, I must have had a revival in my other hand. I remember going down to my truck, and it had been raining that day. That's the rainy mo Sunday morning we had. And I said, I knew I had to reach in my pocket. I had two hands. I had to reach in my pocket to get my keys out of my truck. I said, did I, I said, I wouldn't have laid my Bible on a wet truck. I know I wouldn't have done that. I said, well, that's the only thing I could think I did. And that just, I mean, I was, oh, man. Then I started the blame game. I said, Ned all took my, I said, she all took my Bible. She saw I had my hands full. Then I started, I went even further. I said, why'd Brandon give me that meal to take? He should have took that meal. Then I said, well, Miss Patsy fixed too many meals. I'm going to blame it on her. <laughs> then I said, no, the preacher ordered all them meals. He ordered too many. It's his fault. No. No. I finally said, you know, this, this is, I can't lay this on anybody but me. It's me. And if that's what happened to her, and I still don't know, I can't remember that I did that, but that's the only logical thing I can do. And I'm gonna tell you what it is. It is. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it really hurt me to think that I was that careless with God's word. And I, I mean, I've had to pray for forgiveness for that. If that's what I did, and I'm 90% sure that's what Brad did, he laid it on that truck and drove off with God's word falling somewhere. That's my confession. Anyway, I went to Jeff. Now, Jeff, I said, I got something. I've been losing sleep over it. It's been, I've been bothered. You know, I've asked God to forgive me. He said, he's going to forgive you for that. I said, my only prayer is that that Bible fell somewhere out here and somebody found it, and then it'll reach them through my carelessness. That's the only thing... I can think of the only good I can think can come of it because I've accepted my negligence and I, I'm ashamed to tell you that but I, I think that's what I did 
you know, I have to say that you know everything and everything that we do has consequences. God has a, has a purpose in it. Uh, just like the woman in the coin, she found her lost coin, and there was much rejoicing, and she called all her friends and neighbors in to rejoice. You know, Jesus, this parable he was speaking, he was speaking it not only to a congregation that's listening to him, just like we're listening tonight, he was speaking to the uh, Jewish leaders, the experts of Jewish law. They were there too. And they'd been complaining that Jesus was preaching and teaching to everyone, even those he was even associating with those that thought that they thought of as despicable people. Uh, he was e even eating meals with people that they didn't approve of. They would not recognize their own lostness. Just like the woman with the lost coin, she was re rejoicing when it was found. He says there's rejoicing in heaven when one lost soul repents. You know, we read further in this chapter about the prodigal son. You know, he asked, we all know the story. Um, he asked his father for his inheritance, and he willingly gave it to him. Uh, he had a good time in a foreign land until the money ran out. Then he got to thinking, you know, famine struck the land, and, and he got to thinking, you know, here I am uh, feeding hogs and having to eat what they eat. And even my father's servants get treated better than this. And uh, so he decided, you know, rather than starve to death or lower myself into doing what this, this lowly task is, that I'm going to go back home to my father. So he went back. And before he got back, as soon as he got within sight, his father evidently had been watching, looking for his son to come back in. And he saw him a long distance away. And he ran to him. And at this time, it was a humiliation for a person in that culture to run, an older person to run. And they say he even pulled up his garments and ran. And that was even more humiliating. But he didn't worry about that. He ran to his son. He kissed his son. He sent for the finest robe. He put a, a, a jeweled ring on his hand and then restored his full rights as a son. He honored him with a feast, saying his son is lost and now is found. These were Jesus' words. He was speaking this, he was telling us that if we come to the Father, that, Jesus, that God is waiting for us to come, through him, come to him, uh, him through his son, Jesus Christ, and that is the reception we will receive we will receive forgiveness for our sins and we become heirs of the Father. The true children of the most powerful. Just like verse 10 in this uh, chapter 15 says, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. And that's my message for tonight. Rod, would you uh, close us in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we want to raise all the people up their own prayer list that your healing hand be placed upon them, Lord, and that you make them well. Lord, now we would like to ask that you be with us as we leave your house. Go out into the world. Help us spread your word. And Lord, bring us back safe on Sunday morning through the further service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bible. You will make me a happy man. As uh, Jeff said, Jesus loves you, and so do I. <laughs>